When we think about our minds, we just sung a song about our heart and our mind and our will that's behind devoting ourselves. The mind is a powerful thing. We've been made in the image of God. We might not have instincts like animals do. We may not have the sense of hearing, the sense of smell. It may be more acute in animals than, than it's in us. But we have a mind. We have a, a mind that considers things. We can be aware of what's happening around us. We can be reminded of our experiences. We still remember things that have happened in our, our life. Through our brains and our mind and our being, we, we have sensibility. We can feel. We have emotions that are involved that come from our mind based upon what's around us. And we have volition. We have the will to put things together and to do things. What a powerful thing that is. But all of it's involved a lot of times in the decisions we make. Joshua, the 24th chapter, verses 14 through 16. Joshua is striving to get his people to make a choice. And he talks about, you know, if it, is, if it feels evil to you, I want to fear Jehovah now. But if it's, uh, if it's evil to serve, serve God, then you, you make up your mind. But for me and my house, we're going to serve Jehovah. There's the awareness of their past history. There's awareness of the, of the proposition that is before them. That they are to turn their backs upon the old, the old gods that they had served. And now they're to serve only the true God. They're to fear God. They're to feel if it's, if, if it's evil or right to, to, to do that. And then they had the volition that you're going to be involved in choosing whom you're going to serve. So we read in Scripture, we see, we see godly men pleading with people to make up their mind upon what is being focused upon at that time. And what we're going to focus on is the will of man. I didn't know what the song was going to be before the lesson. Derek didn't know what I'm preaching on. At least he didn't ask me. And I'm the only one that knew about it, what I was going to preach today. But what a remarkable song for a fellow who studied about the will this week. And to see a song that's being sung in every one of you saying these words. You take my will. You take my heart. You, you take my, all of my emotions and those things. I don't have to preach tonight. Because you're going to go out here and do it, aren't you? Because what is it? My mind is made up. Take my will. Put it in line with you. You got my heart. You got my mind. You got everything about me. So I just need to kind of give you some marching orders and boop, we're out of here. Because that's how powerful the mind is when we turn it over to God and follow his will. It's sometimes not the difficulty of understanding what's being said. It's dealing with our mind and our heart of saying, I want to put that together. Jesus focused upon the will of man. And this may seem counterintuitive to you, but what Jesus said is interesting in John 7 and verse 17. If any man willeth to do his will, he start, if I just will to do my will, I will know the teaching. I will know the teaching, whether it's of God or whether I speak from myself. It's an interesting passage. We'll come back and look at verses connected with that. But if you, if you will to do God's will, you'll know of my teaching. Am I speaking from myself and my, the glory of myself? Or is my teaching opening up your minds to the will of God and to the character of God? Am I seeking my own prestige or am I trying to get you to see the will of God. If you will to know the teaching, you'll know the character of that teaching. You'll know the mannerisms. You know when a person is trying to promote themselves or when you know more about God's word than you got about that you know about that person. And that's what Jesus was focusing upon. That will of man is that powerful that we can know if the teaching is true or not. If we will to do it. And it works the opposite well, too. Man's will is a foundation of knowing the source of Jesus' teaching. Is it from God, or am I speaking out of my own ego? Am I speaking from myself? And if you simply say, I want to do God's will, I'm willing to put God's will, you'll know the teaching he's given you. That was Jesus' point that he makes. The essential goal is that our will 
It's powerful. Our will is to be in line with God's will. That's the goal. You've already said you're going to do it. So that we got the battle half fall. We just need to know what the will is. Because our will is going to be in charge with God's will. But we have a problem. We've got our self-glory. We don't want to give up our, our self. There's the glory of men in battle with God's glory. And in John the seventh chapter, the very, the very verse following Jesus' point where you'll know the teaching, whether it is of, of God or not, notice what he says in verse, in verse 18. When he says, he that speaketh from himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh the glory of him that sent me, that's God, I'm seeking his glory. The same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And so there's the motive of the teacher that the person that you're teaching can perceive. And you don't want to get in, you don't want to get between God's teaching and that person's understanding of what God wants them to do. And that's where we get in the, the process. Of, well, we get in the way. Am I seeking my own glory or the glory of him that sent me? And what we seek, I want God's glory to be shown. It won't be about what I think it is or what it should be. I'm giving you what glorifies God. And the problem is, is that am I seeking the glory of man? Am I seeking my own glory? Am I trying to fit my own self in some way that's selfish? Or am I just totally committed to know God's will? If you will to do his will, you'll, you'll have the battle half gone. You'll see what God's glory is. And you'll see if I'm speaking for my own glory or am I highlighting God's glory. That becomes the point. John 7 and verse 7, that same chapter, we read this. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Why? Why does the world hate Jesus? Because I testify of that it is works are evil. You shouldn't say that about us. Your works are evil, Jesus says. He doesn't mix any words. If we want to stay in the world, if we want to promote what we're doing, and you call it evil, I hate you. My mind, my feelings are now being turned against you. And Jesus says the world hates me because of that very fact. That mind is powerful, but sometimes self-glory is getting in the way of the teachings of God and the mind that says, I'm going to do that. It's that self-glory. For example, if you have self-glory, you're glorying in yourself or man, you might not follow through with following Jesus. We may sing this song tonight, and we've sung that, my will's going to be turned over to your will, O oh God, and you see what that will of God is. It doesn't mean you're going to follow through. Because you've got the old the self that says, I don't know, I, I, might not, I, just, I might not carry that through even though I know what, what the truth is. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, in verses 24 and 25, Then said Jesus unto disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life shall lose it. Whosoever, was, was, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now that may be hard to understand. How can you gain life by losing it? He's talking about you care about this life? Are you willing to give up this life for the sake of God's will about the life that is to come? But dedicated to God as such that you're going to follow, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to deny yourself. You have to take up your personal burden, not the cross of Christ, but take up your personal burden. That, well, I wanna, I've got to follow God. He has, this is his will. It's going to be difficult, but I'm going to do that because I have committed to following Jesus. And that's, it's, Jesus said that's what it takes, that you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. It'd be easy. Let's just follow Jesus. But you've got to deny yourself, turn your will over to his will, and follow that. And sometimes that gets in the way. So we know the truth. We know that's a, right, that's a life I ought to live. But we have a hesitancy. We have something that's a barrier there. And it's ourself. We glory in ourself. We glory in men. Maybe the praise of men. Instead of the, the glory of God. This gets in the way in Hebrews the 10th chapter. Where people 
had a strong will. These were people that had been converted to the Lord. They had a Jewish background. They, they were Jews and they obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, they said, well, Lord Moses, that only convicts me. And it was pointing, our, pointing the way to, for the coming of Jesus. And you hear that gospel and you submit it to it. You will and you, you start living that life. But what's happening in the book of Hebrews is that those Jewish Christians are on the verge of apostasy. See, their heart's turning away from the Lord. They're not going to follow the Lord. And it's about the will. Listen to it. For if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth. Let me just stop there. What sin do you do that hasn't first passed your will? I, I know lying is wrong, but I'm going to lie at this moment because I've got to get out of trouble. Your will determined that I'm, I'm going to tell the lie. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Which do you do? Which sin do you commit unwillfully? You determine to get drunk. You determine to do this. You determine to, to practice fornication. You determine to do that. So we, what is he saying here? Uh, if we sin willfully, I mean, everything I do is willful. I may do it willf not willfully because it crept up on me. That's not my general uh, attitude, not my general action. And, and therefore, but you, your will did it that day. He's saying that if I am determined to not follow Jesus any longer, that's the determined will. He wants us to know there's no more sacrifice for sins when you do that. If we sin willfully after the knowledge of the truth, that's where they were. There's no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fierceness of fire which will devour the adversaries. What's that? That's the future judgment of God. Your mind's aware of that. They've been taught that. They knew the judgment was to come. And if you turn away from Christ, there's no one to save you from hell. A man that has said it not, Moses' law dieth without compassion. You want to go on back under the old law? Here's what the law said. That if, you, if a man has said it not, Moses' law, he dies without compassion on the word of two or three witnesses. They confirmed this is what you did. You picked up sticks on the Sabbath day. You will be put to death under the old law. You want to go back under that law, Jewish Christians? But you have made it a point to turn your back. You're sinning willfully. It's turning their back upon Jesus. How much sore punishment, think ye, shall he be judged worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God? See, he doesn't mean anything to you anymore. So you trodden underfoot the Son of God. You counted the blood of the covenant wherewith you were sanctified. He was sanctified. I, I was a Christian. I, I started following him. But my will is now I'm turning away, willfully doing that. You consider that blood an unholy thing and have done despite under the spirit of grace. You're saved by God's grace. You can't be saved by God's law. It can only condemn you. So the Hebrew writer is laying out, you know what the consequences of this decision? I willfully do it. I don't care about Jesus any longer. The judgment is what's ahead of you. And what's in the way? Lack of knowledge, I know exactly what's going to happen at the judgment. I don't care. Because I'm going to serve myself. It's going to be my will and not God's will. And these people were deliberately turning their backs on Jesus. That's what it means here to sin willfully after we have the knowledge of the truth. It's not talk about your everyday sins that you do. I don't know of any sin that you don't do willfully. At that moment, your mind says, I'll do it. And that's what we have to guard against. I want my will to be in line with God's will. And sometimes whatever it is, the glory of men, the glory of a religion, it clouds our minds and we don't follow through. If we have self-glory, we'll, we'll pervert the revealed will of God. Back to John, the seventh chapter, the passage we started with, with Jesus speaking about the will. In John 7, verses 20 and 23, it says, The multitude answered, Thou hast a demon. Who seeketh to kill thee? He's talking about the world hating him. 
and that they want to kill him. Well, who's, who's doing that? Jesus answered, said of them, I did one work and you marvel because thereof. Moses had given you circumcision. Not that it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And he says, and on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. See, the priest would form circumcision on a man. Wonder if the child on the eighth day of their birth fell on a Sabbath day. Did they do work on that day? Yes. They would circumcise a man. And that was permissible. It's permissible to God and so forth. But he says, if a man receiveth circumcision on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses may not be broken. They were doing it because they had to be circumcised on that day. Are you wroth with me because I made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath? See, they were condemning him because he healed on the Sabbath. He made a person whole, where circumcision was taking a part of a, a man's body away. <laughs> and the circumcision of the flesh. So what does, what does he say in verse, is, is that the, he, he lays a parallel. And he, we'll just, we'll come back to it, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Make your judgments. But you have no problem with somebody doing something that takes away on the Sabbath day so you could fulfill the law. And yet I made a man every much whole on the Sabbath, and you say, I got a demon. Because I realize you're wanting to, to put me to death. Paul was very angry when this gets in the way. And he doesn't mix his terms. It's, he puts it this way in Galatians 5, 12. Who want, they want to be justified by the law of Moses and demand circumcision. He says, I would that they that unsettled you would even go beyond circumcision. Don't just cut away the flesh. Cut away the whole organ. Go beyond circumcision. For ye, brethren, were called for freedom. Only use not your freedom for occasion to the flesh, but through love be servants one to another. So we can pervert the law if we want ourselves to be glorified. We want it our way. We want, to, we want to win an argument. And with Jesus, you couldn't do that. And how easy it would be when I, I just want to follow the truth. The truth is pretty clear. But that gets in our way. If self-glory, you'll be focused upon appearance instead of what is right. And that's what John 7, 24. Don't judge according to appearance. An appearance that looks like a priest is doing work on the Sabbath day and he's circumcising someone. An appearance that looks like that's sinful. Don't judge according to appearance, but judge according to righteousness. What's right? And in the law, there was, there was an allowance for, for the priest to be doing his work so that other part of the law would not be violated and happened to come on a Sabbath day. But normally that work was not to be to be done. Judge not according to appearance. You know, it can work another way. It can make people look real holy and real righteous, real godly. And it's just appearance. Look at this in Colossians 2 and verse 20. If you die with Christ from the rudiments of the world, we made a will to turn our lives over to Christ and we died to this world, the first principles of this world. Why is though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to ordinances? So what were they doing? We're not going to touch anything and we're going to keep ourselves away from all things of this world because we're holy. We're not going to be contaminated by the world. So what do they do? They handle not. They taste not. They touch not. And he says, all these things are to perish with using after the precepts and doctrines of men. That's man's teaching, not God's. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and severity to the body. And I must be a holy man if that's happening. Nope, that's appearance. But we get captivated by that. That's a humble man. And he, he keeps himself from all those things. He must be a righteous man. No. What's he teaching? But are not of any value against the indulgence of the flesh. You can keep yourself away from the marriage relationship. You can sit around and, and, and fast. And you can be in some monastery way up, up in a mountain. And you can be called a holy man. 
but that will not help you in the indulgence of the flesh. Your mind can be wicked. Your mind can be thinking upon things that are not righteous, they're not pure. And you can be rotten to the core, but you sure look holy, don't you? And it has an appearance of that, but it's not an indulgence of the flesh. You know what it is? It's that I've determined to follow Jesus. And yes, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But I'm going to strive each day to put away my, my lust. I'm going to work on my problem. I'm going to work upon the things that are keeping me from heaven. And I'm going to do that. My will is such I'm turning it over to the Lord. Take my heart, take my mind, take my will, let it conform to you. And this is the battle. It's a battle in religious differences. It's a battle of the lust of the flesh. It's, it's a battle of all the things of doing what we need to do because Christ lays it out there. You're going to have to deny yourself. That's a willpower. That's knowledge and will if you're going to ever walk with me. And there's the battle. But we've sung already. You've already sung the song and said, you take my will. And if we don't get self in the way, you'll do that. You'll do that. The essential goal is to finally obey God's will. Finally get it done. And what we have to do, we have to move from good intentions to actually doing it. In Matthew, the 21st chapter, in verses 28 through 32, Jesus tells a story. And you've, you can understand this. It's not going to be difficult. Which one of these Men did the will of the Father. Did the will of the Father. Verse 28. He says, a man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. Okay, now that's not hard to understand. Dad wants me to go work. And he answered and said, I will not. <laughs> You've ever had that obstinate son? <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not going. I, I know you called me. I'm not going to do it. But he said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. He came to the second son likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. I go. And I'm going to do that. But he didn't go. He went not. Which of the two did the will of the father? Fellow said, I'm going to do it. Got good intentions. When dad leaves the room, he just got to go back to bed. I said, you know, I need to get up. It's go I, I said, no, I'm going to go do it. Which finally did the will of the Father? We know. And, it, and Jesus tells a story. He knows everybody knows this. And he says, well, the first one did. No, he's the one who said he's not going to go. But he did go. He repented. He changed his mind. Changed his will. Jesus said to him, verily I said to you that the publicans and harlots... Those evil tax collectors, those evil women, the prostitutes. They will go into the kingdom of heaven before you will. Before the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness. And ye believed him not, but the publicans and harlots believed him. And ye, when ye saw it, you would not even repent yourselves afterward that ye might believe him. Notice repentance comes before belief here. Well, that's not the way it works. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to repent of my sins and be baptized. Understand that. But repentance here is the change of mind. And that's getting in the way of believing in Jesus. How many people today, and I may be speaking to some, because I, it's something will happen. I find a lot of people that think that God is pleased with them because they have good intentions. They have good intentions. If I tell you I intend to do this, I may never do it. But you must think I'm a good person because, see, I intended to do that. I intended to show up. I intended to do this. I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going. I'm going. I'll be there right with you. And all they had were have a good intentions. They never translate that into action, complying with what the job entailed. And I think a lot of people feel comfortable with good intentions. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And you never do it. That's okay. You know, we're just human. But God's not pleased with that. And what happens is that he's telling a story. 
and these people that you would consider to be hopeless sinners, they will come in the kingdom before you. And when you saw that happening, you yourselves would not change your mind. Why? Because self-glory. And yet here are people that realize my life is a wreck. I may be very covetous. That's why I took this job as tax collector. I get rich on it. And doing that which is evil. But they can change their mind. They can change their, their ways. And you can too. But we must put God's will. And actually there comes a time when I cannot procrastinate any longer. I take this step. I Either I become a Christian. Instead of oh, one day I'm going to do that. There comes a time when you walk that step. You take those steps. And we make the good confession. We enter into the baptistry. You're baptized. Good intentions is going to keep a lot of people out of heaven. Because they think that's okay. That's, that's, uh, that's pleasing to God. I never find. And I'm still reading. And I'm still studying my Bible. I never find. Where God is saying, well, you had good intentions, that's fine. And without any action. You know, I don't find good intentions being rewarded. I think a lot of people will lose their soul because of that. We've got to obey God's will. We must move from talk to doing. I've been talking a lot about singing that song and talking about doing those things and putting that into practice. But it doesn't make a bit of difference. You may be embarrassed if you don't put in things into practice after singing that song to God, and you should be. You, and it, it should be, God, I'm singing this because I want to, and you may be there, so, but God, please forgive me. I'm not there yet, but help me get there. I mean, that would be a good thing. But it's got to start by saying, I, I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm going to do it. And Jesus helps us along that way. He makes it very clear who's going to enter into heaven. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father who is in heaven. Very clear statement. You don't, you, you can't miss it. I say it, preacher does a lot of talking. What's his life like? Does he put it into practice? I'll be held as a, a heavier judgment because of what I do. And, and then for what I don't do. And it has to work from just talking and finally doing that. That's important. Jesus' family. When Jesus says, I'll tell you who my family is. It wasn't blood, relatives. That's who was out there wanting to see him. And they were saying, your family's here. They'd like to see you. And Jesus used this as an opportunity to teach who truly is his family. And he's speaking about the spiritual family of God. Verse 49 says, he stretched forth his hand toward the disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. He stretched his hand toward the disciples. Behold, my brother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father who is in heaven. He is my brother, he is my sister, and he is my mother. And she is my mother. And she is my sister. He's my brother. She's sister. That's my mother. No, no, Mary's your mother. And I'm not saying Mary wasn't a, going to be a follower of Jesus, but he's emphasizing. That's members of my flesh and blood family. They want to talk to me. I'll tell you who my family is. Who is more important? Not that they're going to neglect Jesus on the cross. He tells John, behold your mother. He wanted John to take care of his mother. He didn't, he didn't resent her and turn her away. But there's an emphasis this is my family. Jesus looks down from heaven today and says, you know who my family is? It's not those people that do a lot of talking up there. It's not that preacher that does talking. It's, it's the preacher that does something. It's a preacher that is involved teaching people and they sing a song unto my father. Take my heart, and take my will, take my, my mind and all that, put it into practice. And we sing it and we have good intentions. But I hope at this point we say, no, I'm going to translate that into action because I truly want to be in the family of God. And Jesus looks down and says, that's my family. They're doing the will of God. And you know what? Jesus looks down and you want a personal relationship with Jesus, you can't get any closer than being a member of his spiritual family, the church. How do you know that? Because in Acts the ninth chapter, 
When Saul is on his way to Damascus to grab a bunch of Christians, more Christians, and take them back and put them to death, put them in jail, put them to death, he's out here to kill him Christians. He was interrupted by a bright light, and he came in contact with the Lord. And he will know who, who, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you crucified, who you persecuted. Jesus was put to death, he's resurrected. But my people, I am connected with my people. They're the ones you are persecuting. You're persecuting me. You can't get any closer to Jesus than him said, that's me. This is my family. This is my mother. This is my sister. This is my brother. These are my people. And when the Lord sees you standing for what's right and being persecuted for what's right, he said, they're persecuting me. They want their own religion. They want their own interpretation of scriptures. They've got the self-glory all in the way. We get that cleared up and we realize I've got to bring my will in accordance with God's will. I've got to eventually put those things into practice and do them. The mind of man is powerful. It's the foundation for knowing. If you know, if you will to do his will, you'll know the true source. Is that man really teaching the truth of God? Is he putting himself in the place of this word? Or am I reading it with him? Am I studying it with him? Is it truly the will of God? If we have our will in line, our will to do what your will is, we'll know the teaching. That will is so powerful, it can keep us from being obstinate. It can turn being obstinate to obeying God. That's a marvelous thing. Do you have obstinate children that just sit there and will not do something? It's frustrating as a parent, isn't it? It's a powerful thing. But once that you've broken into that heart and those senses and it softens that and then to the point of putting into practice, what a wonderful thing it is. And that's the same thing with people. And you can do some of those difficult things like turning your life away from sin to serving God. I talk to people sometime that say, well, I'm going to try to get that right before I get started again. Good intentions. I got to, what do you mean get it right? You got to be perfect. You can't take a step today and, and do what's right and, and, and then try to take that other step. What do you do on a diet? You're all perfect on your diet? Or do you just quit your diet after a few days when you say, well, I'm not doing any good? It is a constant battle, isn't it? When you set your goal, this is what I need to do, this is what I need to accomplish. And you'll have setbacks, but you don't stop. And the beautiful thing about being a Christian is that when we do sin, after we become a Christian, 1 John 1 says that if you will confess your sins, all right, this is what I did, God. I had good intentions. I just didn't do it. Forgive me. As a child of God, that your sins have been washed away by his blood, that blood continues to be available. That when we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive you of all, listen to that, all unrighteousness that you do. There's not a sin you can commit that you can't get forgiveness for. When you say, God, I know this is wrong. I'm changing my mind about it. I'm turning my mind around. It's going to affect my life. I'm turning from that. Please give me the strength to do better tomorrow. Forgive me. You can do that. And you can take the next step and the next step and the next step. Because imperfect people will enter into the gates of heaven. Harless and Tax collectors will be there because they changed their life to serve the Lord. And if we make it to heaven, it's because we just kept on going and kept on striving each day. Each day can be a new day and you don't get discouraged because we're, we're not perfect. We're not sinless. But God has provided for the forgiveness of sins after we become a Christian. So don't delay, say, I am tonight, I'm going to become a Christian. Or I am going to turn my life around, I want to start serving God like I've done in the past. That may be where we are. You can do that. And all it is is a mind that says, I will to do this and help me, God, on that journey. And that's the blessings, that's God's grace, that's his love, 
That's his great wisdom in providing for us, in perfect man, a way to be righteous before a perfect God. And I hope that will give you encouragement to begin that life as a Christian. And if you've fallen away, to come back to the Lord and strive to do better tomorrow. But if we can help you in any way to get right with God, set your will in function. Say, I'm going to do that tonight and do it as we stand and as we sing.